On this episode of Marketing Against the Green, we are gonna tell you how AI is gonna completely transform marketing. We're gonna tell you the new skills marketers need to learn, the new tools that are gonna be coming out for marketers, and stay tuned for the number one thing we feel marketers should do today if they want to remain relevant in the AI era. Let's get into today's show. On today's episode of Marketing Against the Green, we have a very special guest. Nicholas Holland. He is the GM of Marketing Hub at HubSpot. He is, I would say, one of the foremost experts in the world about tools and problems that face marketers. Because all Nicholas does is talk to marketers every single day and look at new technology and use cases to help them. And so we wanted to do to start off the year a marketing technology deep dive. We're gonna to talk to you about all the foundational technologies, cool new tools and use cases. It's gonna be a blast. Nick, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me guys, it's gonna be fun. Nick, to start off today's show, I'd love it if you just like, set the stage for us like what's happening out there in the mean streets of marketing technology <laughs> land like what what's what what are marketers coming in up against in 2024 there's a i live in nashville and and there was an interview that shania twain did one time and and they basically were like oh my god you're like an overnight success and i remember her chuckling a little bit because she had been sleeping in her car and basically hitting up all the bars for almost a decade. And so she said, yeah, I'm like a 10 year overnight success. And I think about that with marketing because it was almost three years ago where GPTs first hit. And I remember we internally were like, man, this is an interesting project. Not very good, but it's definitely interesting. And I don't know how a lot of the marketers feel listening to this, but I definitely get sentiment when we talk to customers about, man, this feels like it happened overnight. And really it's been, you know, a, a slow, steady progress of like the last decade to get here. So when I think about what's happening overall, I think, uh, you know, for the stuff we dive in today, you've got first, uh, marketing is dramatically changing. So I would say if I'm a marketer and I'm listening right now, I'm like, man, is this hype or is this uh, real? And it's real. I think the second thing that's happening is uh, you have effectively some new muscles to build. A lot of marketers don't know this, but new muscles will be really important in this next phase and we can jump into that. And then I think the last thing that's interesting is uh, everything's happening so fast, it's quite hard to understand what to even do next. And so I think that I'm seeing a lot of analysis paralysis out of a lot of customers right now. And what that ends up doing really is it benefits the incumbents because the incumbents, they just wait for their tools and, and things like that to basically catch up. So there's a little bit of risk if you don't have a, a high innovating or a fast incumbent that you're using. On the flip side, there's a little bit of myopic nature where if you don't look outside of what you're doing, you won't even know what's possible, like a hot other's uh, horizon issue. So in general, I think right now, if I was a young marketer coming out, boy, I'd, I'd be on fire because you can run circles. It's almost like basically when people didn't know about some of these things back before, you know, the internet, the digital marketing, you can run circles around. If I'm an older marketer, marketer, I definitely need to basically make sure I don't have a who moved my cheese situation, which is this is how we do it. This is how we basically generate leads. This is how we work with our sales team. And then stuff changes pretty fast. So that's kind of where my head's at. So you mentioned like marketers need to learn new things. Um, what are some of the things you think are top on that list? So the the there are a bunch of foundational things that I think I'm <clears throat> fascinated by when I'm at Thanksgiving or Christmas with my family. I'm constantly checking in just to see like where the, the normal day to day person is. I think that search is changing. A lot of us know that. But until you actually get into it, once again, you have a horizon issue. And so, you know, I, I don't know how you feel, Kit, but it feels like every year we're like search is changing. They're moving to a single click. They're going to take our data. They're going to do this. But until you actually get into using the new forms of search, it's very challenging to understand how it's changing. I well, so I think, but, but Nicholas, to interrupt you for just a second, I think that's the difference about 2024 is that search has been changing. It's kind of back to your Shania Twain story. Mm -hmm. It's changed over the last decade and now it just feels like it's changing all at once. But what's happening in 2024 is there are some actual alternatives. There are new tools that you could use and actually get a better result. And that hasn't really been the case up until the last like six-ish months. It's been like, yeah, exactly. I think it's been like a battle up, like it's everything's constantly changing. I think it's been like a step function change. I'll give an example is like, if you haven't used, uh, there's two things. If you haven't used the paid version of ChatGPT where you ask it to search the web, 
you probably don't know what we're talking about. Or if you aren't using Bing Copilot, you probably don't know. But an example I was uh, thinking about is we've got some snow down here in Nashville. I had some winter burn on my trees. And usually I would do something like a search query, like how to prevent winter burn on your trees. And then you would scroll through SERP results. You would then click on a few. You would get past some of the modals and the chat bots or the, the, the pop-up modals. You would get down. Then you would scan through the article. You would try to find a piece there. And then this is the big aha. It then typically either is a very, very well thought out long pillar post to which they were thinking of all the thing, or you're left with another question and you have to repeat that process all over again. What's really changed is being able to go back and forth. And so I'll give you an example. I asked about winter burn, how to prevent it. And it says you should cover your plants. I went out and bought some stuff from Amazon. So weird, that drove a commerce cycle over at Amazon. Then I was like, well, damn, how long do you cover the plants? <laughs> and I really had no idea because the article I read didn't tell me. And I'll, do I keep them wrapped up for a night, for a week? It turns out that you keep them wrapped up for almost the whole winter season. <laughs> But then more importantly, I then went through and there's like different ways to wrap it. And so then I actually took, this is true story. I copied and pasted the entire Bing chat thing and I sent it to my yard guy who won ironically <laughs> over text goes, what is this? And I was like, this is my conversation with Bing. Here's what we need to do about the bushes. But like, just look at that cycle. I basically had to talk back and forth with it for a while to get what I was wanting. I then took that, passed it over to another person. It drove a commerce cycle. Like, it's just wild. And what's even crazy is like right now, I was thinking to myself, I didn't click on any source links. So we can get into that too. Like, I really do believe that like, as big believers in inbound, I also believe we're gonna have to change inbound muscles because right now, yes, I don't mean this to sound mean, and then this is a little harsh, but the AI companies, by their very nature, have to basically, some say steal, others say incorporate your <laughs> knowledge. But right now, if you begin to basically, you know, help people by writing thoughtful pieces, what you've inadvertently done is you've basically made Google smarter or ChatGPT smarter or Claude smarter or Bing smarter. And by doing that now, they don't have any incentive to come back to you because I'm trying to chat back and forth. And so it's going to change a lot of muscles there, but that's like a foundational one. I'll pause there yeah. for a minute. There's a couple of things in that. So way back when, the very first time kind of ChatGPT was launched, Kip and I were talking about it, its impact, upcoming impact in search, which is really like 18 months ago now. And there was one thing that we really honed in on, which is the speed of iteration. That, that's what I was trying to describe to people is like, the speed that you were able to iterate through questions and answers is like, grades better than a traditional search engine. And you're going to start to see people gravitate towards there because it's just a better, a better experience. And I think that's what, that's kind of what you've seen. You've seen that through ChatGPT. I think ChatGPT, the problem they have is, I don't know if you've noticed the, the latest updates mean that they are really sensitive to copyright. So th there is some, I think, degradation on their quality, but perplexities, these other ones are just like a better experience. So that's speed of iteration. And it's really just like the way to understand this, if you have not tried it, and this blows my mind, like I've posted about this multiple times. I have like the search people come in, Google's a better experience, but they haven't actually tried these, these kind of different options, right? They're still kind of trying to work on the traditional search engine. But the thing to really think about is what, what it's like is you just haven't, a pretty smart people or person go do the search for you, look across all these things, retrieve the information and then provide you the best and most coherent answer. And I think the final nail in the search engine coffin, which is like the traditional search engine coffin is today the argument against these kind of tools as a replacement for Google is just the inaccuracy, right? And hallucination yeah. people see as a bug. It's not a bug. It's actually part of a feature. It's why AI is allowed to solve can solve problems in a creative way because it is able to like hallucinate and think that way. But it's not great as a component of a search engine. If you listen to what Sam Altman said over the weekend and last week about GPT-5, one thing he said is the reliability is a big thing that they are focused on for the next iteration of GPT for GPT-5. And he actually mentioned the fact that if you ask, some, you ask the engine 10,000 10, times the same question, you get such a wide variety of answers of certain quality, and that won't be the case in upcoming models. When, that's the, when that actually happens, there's just no way in my mind that traditional search engines can actually compete with these kind of 
chat experiences. Well, They're just so far inferior. I think there's an interesting world where intersection of this, which is uh, I'm not mad at ChatGPT because I asked this question. We were having a debate with uh, some friends in like a little a private uh, telegram room. And I said, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when the courts decide this, this is going to have a, a pretty profound impact on what goes forward. Because if I look at Kip and I go, hmm, I like that art in the background and I decide to go buy that art. Is that copyright? Is his style protected? Is it the way he dresses, talks, the, way he the, thinks, the yeah. art? His, or his interests. am I allowed to effectively just absorb that? So when you get into right. these models that are multimodal and I'm allowed to absorb visually, absorb you know auditory, absorb from a tech standpoint, and then I can incorporate that, then is that a copyright issue or not? That's one right. fascinating question. And if in the United States we say it is, I pretty much can guarantee the rest of the world won't honor that. So I think what's going to end up happening is, is that dude, Europe will honor that. Do you like just we should we just start we should start with what Europe will do first. Yeah, that's true. Just, Maybe Europe, Europe will. I guess Europe what I'm trying to say wrong. is, yeah. At the end of the day, when you know, my grandfather used to say, "Locks are for honest people." At the end of the day, you know, the reality <laughs> is, is that there will be people who build this stuff, and what I think is going to end up happening, and like one of the things I'm thinking about here at HubSpot. Uh, I believe in human ingenuity. I like the co-pilot model. I think there's an interesting, and I really think of it more as like collaborative. Like I'm just collaborating with Kip. He's smart in certain areas. Karen's smart in certain areas. You know, at the end of the day, we're collaborating. So you'll collaborate with the AI. But what I think will happen is that the open internet is over with. And I think that you've already seen it with the news sites closing down and you know, you've got mm. your free RL. But I think the traditional marketer who's across the street. I talk with her every couple of days and she talks about HubSpot and how she's doing and all this stuff. I think that my advice to her <clears throat> is that pretty soon she needs to gate her blog. She needs to gate basically her resources and her articles because <clears throat> any value or upside she'll get is going to be basically controlled in her communication stream, her funnel. Otherwise, going back to what we were saying about all these search engines, she is going to effectively train all of them and then she will actually, and this gets really meta really quickly, she'll accelerate buy cycles for somebody else. So just like I went and bought burlap from Amazon because of some landscaper who wrote how to do it, and they don't even know that they turned me to do it, I accelerated a buy cycle for Amazon to buy that and twine and got my own landscaping guy to do it. He got all the benefits from inbound and it was from somebody else. And so this is where it gets a little meta. And I think that over time, you'll learn what parts to make public because you don't want to create too much friction when people come to your site. You'll learn which parts to make private because at the end of the day, that's your unique perspective. And then you'll use this on a much more tight funnel basis, which you'll share it to your audience directly and it will not be basically crawled. And I think it'll be, who knows, I think it'll end up being locked, not no crawl text because I don't even think people will necessarily honor that. That's my idea, but could be could be controversial. All right, there, there, there's there's a lot to unpack there. I've got I've got two things. My first first point here is, I, I'm going to give you my number one foundational skill for marketers from a tech perspective this year because it's building off what you're saying, Nicholas. If I was a marketer, I would understand what it takes to fine tune a model, and what that means is, hey, I take some out of the box AI model and I annotate the interactions for a specific use case. And so I see how that model learns. I see the type of information that model needs. I see how hard and easy it is to train the model. I see how long it takes because that's a window into how search is gonna change. That's a window in term, into how you can better monetize that those commerce interactions that Nicholas is talking about without human beings. There, it, it's like this very core foundational skills that goes out to a bunch of modalities. So like, First point here, if you're a marketer, my advice to you is do something to just fine tune a use case of a model. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll take what you said is I, even in HubSpot, I'm pretty aggressive. A lot of people know me, I'm not passive aggressive, I'm aggressive aggressive. <laughs> I, uh, if any person talks to me about AI, it's a little bit aggressive, but I'll do a quick self check and I'll say, tell me, about the final artifacts you've actually made using something. I don't care if it's uh, mm -hmm. audio, video, just tell yep. me the final, and I, and I say final because I wanna know, did they actually get it into production, send it to their boss, you know, distribute it to the team? 
Because to your point, Kip, unless you've used it, you really don't understand it. And there's two things I chuckle with at the same time I say. One, two things to be true at the same time. It might kill all of us. And on the flip side, it's dumb as a sack of hammers if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so I think uh, when people, they chuckle when they actually use it, they go, God, it is dumb. And on the flip side, they're like, my God, it's amazing at the same time. And I think to your point, unless you've gone out and done something, and that, that would be my number one task for every marketer here is like, go make a final artifact and you will start to get a sense where everything is. I, I love that. So training and artifact, I have, I have one prediction to follow up, Kieran, here with everything that Nicholas is talking about. If you listen to what Nicholas was saying around the gating of information, how much all the individual information is actually going to be worth in from, from a model training perspective, whether, that, whether you're a consumer individual or whether you're an individual company, if you believe all that to be true, you would say, oh, well... Apple or uh, Apple or Android is going to run a local consumer model that is just going to be amazing and it's going to take over, right? It's just going to be like, cool, Apple, you have all my photos, you know my style. Here, let me take a picture of this event I got invited to and just tell me exactly what to wear. Yeah. Right? Like, that's what's going to happen here. And we don't talk a lot about Apple. And when we talk about Google with AI, we talk about it from a search perspective, not like an Android mobile perspective. But these kind of edge models on your mobile device are probably going to be one of the biggest consumer use cases of artificial intelligence. See, fine tuning is so important, actually, for all of the reasons you said. But even like, there. You should, we should really understand what we mean by fine tuning. A lot of people think fine tuning is like building a custom chat GBT and uploading the data source, right? And then being able to, you know, query that data source. Although chat GBT, custom chat GBTs, if you upload a data source, like I, that's, I, I kind of give this example in a previous episode that I uploaded pages and pages and pages of David Ogilvy's style, and then try to get the chat, the custom GBT to like be, act like David Ogilvy. Now that's a small fine tuning example, right? Cause I fine tuned on, uh, content, but that content was readily available on the internet. This is the thing that, you know, I need to get into my head and other people. So when I use the chat GBT standard and then the custom GBT trained off David Ogilvy, they're the same because they're using the same inputs, right? So you need to have proprietary data, but it, but I the fine tuning is gonna be so important for marketers because I think over time, even like a HubSpot will have a fine tuned model that it can use for customers based upon their customer data, right? It can input all of the data you're collecting around customers mm -hmm. and I tune uh, some sort of model tune for each and every customer. And that's gonna be a real unlock, I think, for marketers and customers because now you can actually do real things in your, in your style. Look. And then the other thing I'll just end on is on the consumer model, we are getting a Jarvis, right? <laughs> Anyone who's watched Iron Man looked at the Jarvis and thought, this is a cool world, right? GPT-5, one of the things, the call outs for that model is that it can be fine tuned to your needs, which I suspect means you will be able to integrate your Apple data. You will be able, your, your Apple iWatch data. All of the data inputs you gather as a human you can put into this model and it can fine tune for your needs. Cause at the moment it really isn't fine tuned for my needs. Like I, I do the custom instructions. I do a bunch of things to try to make it, like even if I'm uploading, I uploaded every single LinkedIn post that I've ever done as a data input and said like create content in that format. And it didn't sound like me, the content was just bland. It was the average of the internet. But I think the next models are going to be able to fine tune specifically for your needs. And that's where things are gonna get really weird. I think, uh, spicy take, I think uh, we maybe are looking at the problem a little lazy. This is crazy. Oh, oh, I love it. Let's go. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, the first thing I'll go back to, you know, you can tell I'm Southern. I tell all these analogies, but like right now I would talk to somebody who has about that in my old web design company, they have about the design prowess of you know my 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 grandfather they're like oh you know I, I want it to be black and blue and to have this and so we would be going through that and then <clears throat> i would show them something that a classically trained professional designer with six years of art school and using the latest in there and they would be like i don't know i would change that button to pink if it were me and you're like and the reason why i think that's fascinating is that because right now we are starting to get new horizons where we're seeing this data to your point kieran and we want to train it and there are a couple things i'll leave the 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 audience here that i think are fascinating one 
I look at it as you have a really smart white collar intern. They've, yes. they've been trained on the world and exactly. you've got to train them. And so now if you were to have an intern that had a really bad experience, is it that you were a bad boss or that they're basically flawed as a intern? And a lot of times it's because you were a bad boss. And so I love this uh, YouTube video and maybe you guys can put it in the show notes or I could ever be like, I love this writer who came up with this acronym CRAFT. And it's basically context. You basically tell it what you're trying to get done, give it a bunch of background. That's like you pass all your, I'm, you know, Kieran, here's all my posts in the past. Right. And then you basically roll, you kind of tell it who you are, what you're doing. Actions, you tell it what you're trying to get done out of this. I'm trying to make a social media strategy or I'm trying to do a post on LinkedIn or whatever. Format, this is where now people conflate the context of all of Kieran's posts with the format. Like you've got to basically be very clear in your formatting. I want it in this uh, tone, style, emojis. I'm, you know, I joke all the time, whatever. And then target who you're writing for. Craft has become like this, like my favorite of mine model of working with now this white collar intern. Where I think to your point that's gonna start happening is, is that custom models like at HubSpot will give more context without you having to type it. Exactly. And what will happen is we'll know that you're over in the social media tool and you're trying to basically get a LinkedIn post. And so then in the format and the context, we'll know the style, the tone, all that stuff for LinkedIn, which is different than if you're on X or if you're over here. And then you can, the target even matters because right now, Kieran, I bet the way you would chop it up with me and Kieran, I mean, me and Kip are different than if you were basically sending something to your peer group or to your, basically your boss. And so, when you go back to what kind of Kip is saying, I think that like everybody should kind of start to grok craft when they're interacting with these kind of models. Then I think vendors like HubSpot need to do as much of that as possible on your behalf. And then to your point, Kip, I think when we start to get down to the mobile phones and the mini models, I think they'll begin to start doing all that stuff as well. And so then you think about it, you say something like I'm going to a party, it now understands the context of what you said, plus all of your stuff. It understands action. I would like to know what to wear. It then now knows format because you. it says, you know, it now knows I want to give you a picture. So that's where I think now, going all the way back to marketers, if you've never made a final output, it's probably awful because you didn't follow craft or give it enough stuff. Then whenever you get that final output and you basically see how much back and forth it takes, now you start to understand to your point about the tuning, the data, how do I get all of that stuff done more automatically? And that's where vendors like HubSpot really have to close the loop because it's exhausting right now, working with ChatGPT, for example, to get a final product because you have to do all that stuff. Right. Did, can we, and just in terms of like, okay, we talked a little bit about the muscles, right? And in terms of the tools, like what, what are some of the categories of tools that we think will exist like be part of the marketing stack or the MarTech stack in the future that maybe don't exist today? And one, one I would like to just suggest we start on it because I think it is the, the disruptor to a lot of the ways that we do marketing is multimodal tools. Like I think they are, that is going to be the unlock yeah. for a lot of marketers. And I want to, I wanna, can I just toss it over to you? Necklace to see if that comes up in your conversation with marketers or how do you even think about that as a problem space? I think a lot of them don't have the horizon yet, but I'll tell you uh, the first multimodal one that I think was like really neat, like Descript started down this path where they basically transcribed your audio into text and then they allowed you to do some quick editings. And that was like mind blowing. When you saw that, do you remember when they just released that product marketing video? Like, oh, first it's of all, the best I, product video. It's one of the best product marketing videos of all time. But when yeah. you could just see, like, it seems quaint now, but when they first <laughs> had that little thing where you had the person editing the text and it was just like editing the entire episode, you're like, what? What? Well, because <laughs> as a podcaster, good. you know, like, and that's where the marketers right now that do well, if they just keep up with the problems that they're dealing with, there's probably a tool either being built or will be built under the way. So the Descript stuff was neat. <clears throat> and a company that I really like is a startup company called Wondercraft. And there's others working in this area where effectively going into multimodal, they take a LLM model like a chat GPT or a Claude, and they effectively now tune it like, like uh, Kip was saying. So on the background, they do the craft for you. They're probably telling on the background, like, hey, we're actually writing a podcast. 
and there will be an intro and there will be a middle and there will be an outro. And then they let you basically give it some, some additional context. They generate a script. Now this is where things get wild. They then use something like 11 labs, which is this voice uh, tool. And so going back to foundational 11 labs is like a foundational open voice is a new one that just came out. Murph. Those are like three where like you can take your voice, and make it part of the model, or you can use you know, a voice that you like. But they now take a tuned set of prompts going back to a foundational LLM. They generate a podcast. They have a collaborative interface. We would call it a CRUD app, create, read, update, delete app for the user like Nicholas to work with. You then basically take all of that, send it off to a Murph or an 11 Labs or an open voice. They then basically have probably a library of not AI music, just regular old clips that they that they copy like uh, uh, got some sort of copyright or uh, money to do, and then it combines it all and basically makes a podcast. That multimodal now means that a normal business that doesn't have an editor or understand all the tooling can now go put out a podcast, and this opens up all new worlds for like an SMB because right now, imagine if I only had a thousand customers. None of us would recommend they do a podcast with a thousand customers. Just not, it's too much work for a small audience. Much. And so unless they want to go hard in the paint and try to build something really, really big, that's like yelling into the wind. On the flip side, for them to make a podcast about the comings and goings of their business for their thousand audience with something like a Wondercraft, absolutely possible. But no one would listen to that podcast. This is my this is my one this thing. Is Kieran's about take. Tools, I know what you're going like, to say. No one will listen to that podcast. I, the hard I, thing about the podcast, I, I, I think the hard thing about the podcast is creating something in a world where there is like unlimited choice today that someone someone will actually take time to listen to. I actually I actually think it's not always getting to the end point. Like I actually think video, we can get into video, but for podcasting in general, I don't know if the tools are going to be a huge unlock because it's so hard to actually create an I, engaging I think, format. I think podcasting. you're right, but I think what's changing about this is that right now, I'll give you an example. This, but like I did whenever, um, oh, what was the one that podcast uh, Spotify bought something .fm. Anyways, it allowed you Anchor Anchor Anchor, anchor .fm. Don't care that. Yeah, yeah. It allowed you for the first time to do a little podcast from your mobile device. So let's just think yeah, about it. Just just while and I did this little thing called Three Spot because I made a podcast just for our internal sales team. Yeah. And I basically I did easy. three minutes of product updates. Right. And dude, in like a short amount of time, I had like three or 400 little listeners. I had legal calling me up and getting on to me, telling me I can't be doing this. <laughs> but the issue is, is that I think to your point, am I trying to get on to Kip's phone as he peruses the world of best business and marketing podcasts? No. Right. But am I trying to get into my micro audience and do that? And so that's where people, I, I go back to, I think to myself, they're like, oh my God, these uh, AI, is it going to make a bunch of crappy content? I'm like, that's a solved problem. Same thing goes with, to your point about podcasts. I think that at the end of the day, if you have a bad content and you don't have it tied to the right on, that's a solved problem. So you're right. There will be a bunch of people who make podcasts that go nowhere, but it will unlock a lot of micro audiences is my belief. Well, right. well what the, the key point you're making here, which is very, you kind of are both right. Cause Kieran, you're arguing that it's not, you're not gonna be able to make a mass scale podcast from AI. And I agree with you, but Nicholas is basically saying for the entirety of business text has been the default way of communicating, especially with a small group internally. And that's no longer going to be true. True. But you can, you're, the cost of creating audio video is just going to be just as cheap as text. And so depending on what you're trying to get across, you're just going to pick the format that best communicates that for Nick, who builds products, it's probably video, right? you like, you would want a little video demo inter interjected with your o overlay, right? Much better than like out of a stagnant, email and that i think is what you're saying is like we're kind of on the precipice of that you're going to start seeing that really happen over the next 12 months yeah, yeah. I, I think i think if you think about it right <clears throat> ai if you're if you create really bad content ai is an accelerant for you to create totally. more bad content right <laughs> but, it, but this is kind of my point if you create really good content ai is an accelerant for you to create good content i agree with that a multitude of different formats right so like That's it right. actually is an accelerant but the third the thing you really have to learn i think in today's world is, is be, like it has never been more important to be a content creator yeah. because you can actually create great content in a multitude of different forms much, much easier. 
Um, but I, See, but I, there I are, just heard it, you say AI was NOS, like <laughs> Fast and the Furious, you know, where they have the NOS <laughs> and it super boosts the cars. That's what I just heard you say. Every basically. film they boost the car. Like it's like you know, every film they have these like big rocket engines in the car and boost the car. Yeah, so it's a, it's it puts like turbo. It's a turbo engine on on good content. It's a turbo engine for people who create bad content. The one I really want to touch on, Nicholas, because I think you used to talk to me about this all the time, is like the video component, yeah. right? And if you look at if you look like a runway, it is just unbelievable what we're starting to see in video. The the fact you can go from take an image and put that like what people need to understand that multimodal is I can I can uh, image is the input, text could be an input, video can input, and I could convert that to any other format. Some of the most impressive examples I've seen is like inputting an image and bringing that image to life. And I just want to, I'm curious, like how you think about that, like marketing is a huge part of HubSpot's business. How do you think about AI and video as part of your product roadmap? It's, um, so as part of a, a product roadmap, we know video is very important. And right now where HubSpot stands is more like we want to be the place where you, uh, you know, store it, basically publish slash distribute it, and then the analytics and things like that around it. We don't do anything in the generation space um, right now to do video, as you you know, like you're you're using a, some sort of video editor. You're having to spend a bunch of time going to get source video, and then there's a lot of what they call B-roll. B-roll is like things that elicit emotion or support what you're saying on the audio or video track, um, and then and then you go for that. You know, runway in a series of others are basically really good at b-roll right now so if you get a chance to watch some of these you'll see and you'll chuckle if you're a marketer you'll see some sort of poignant voice in the background like you know <laughs> here at fidelity blue skies <laughs> yeah. right? and it's like birds flying across the place yeah, yeah. you know? and, yeah. like, and it's like you know it's all about hard work and there's someone hammering something <laughs> anyways so that's about as much as the ai can do but it's very effective because a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, a video is worth 10,000 words. And at the end of the day, that will work. You then set that over here. And I think that there will be times where you're trying to elicit some sort of emotive response uh, or maybe tell a, a clever story with a bunch of B-rolls. That's what we're going to see. And it's going to get better and better. You then move over to the fact that like Nicholas sounds a certain way, has certain mannerisms, talks a certain way. I think that's going to be another multimodal model. So to what you were saying, Kieran, like there will be some work for it to sound like Nicholas. And I mean, sound like text wise, then there'll be some work for it to sound like my voice. And so you see like open yeah. voice as an example. Have you played with, have you played with Hey Jen? Well, I was gonna say, and then Hey Jen, yeah, like now the they're working and... on the lips. Right. And they are capturing some, really what it is is B-roll of your body. So you see me right. doing like this, it's a B-roll of my body. And now for the first time, you know, imagine, look at your background, Kieran. It's, a, it's quaint, it's like beautiful camera. You've got your little- Professional. Like, yeah, it's professional. But right now, if it had your voice and it could basically talk like you, then really you could now have a video of you delivering something like, hey guys, as you know, Blank just dropped a new tool or a new episode. We'd love to have you come out there. And so that's awesome because now your crew, with your blessing, can take your likeness, your voice, and they can literally have you do promos for the upcoming video. And that is a tight use case. It's not you pontificating about the world. Exactly. But that is something where now I think that's going to be the next one. And for me personally, Nicholas, I mean, specifically Nicholas, would I be okay with somebody doing that for an upcoming speaker event for me? Or would I be okay with that being a new product release? Hey guys, we just dropped this product here at HubSpot. Of course I would. That is what's coming. And then you don't have to be a rocket scientist to drag the spreadsheet out another one, two, three, four years. And next thing you know, you take somebody like character.ai, which is trying to build an avatar platform. And now you have a whole model for building the Nicholas character. And now it is all about my, there will be laws around it. Hopefully Europe leads, dear God. Uh, but there will be <laughs> laws around it. But at the end of the day, now, instead of these deep fakes being so poorly looked upon, what it'll come down to is I will be able to use my likeness and then my audience will just have to trust that I was the filter of when it was used. So I don't think they'll care. Literally, if it's like, hey man, we dropped a new podcast, check it out. I don't think they're going to be like, Kieran, was that really you or was that AI? I don't oh, think well, they're going to care. 
this is okay. There's a couple of great things in here that we should get into. So first of all, I created, I've created a bunch of Heijin videos and you might have the same problem as me where I'm very expressive with my hands. The, the, the Heijin video, Nicholas, we like every kind of two minutes. <laughs> It's it's too too heavy on your B-roll. Yeah, it's my hands were like and they were like they got disconnected from my actual <laughs> words. So you have to like, you have to like be kind of stoic with the hands on the page in. But one of the things you said I think is like really interesting. Um uh, so first of all, we me and Kip have said like mul multiple times there should be a B2B version of character AI because imagine you're a B2B company, you want to sell a product to like marketing directors or VPs of sales, and you could actually have a conversation with someone who's ex ex explicitly feels their pains, right? Like you could actually have a ready-made audience to go talk to. But the one I really want to talk to is what you talked about at the end, where like I would send the video of me to like, let's say I did it for a really good use cases as podcast, right? We, I do outreach for, let's say 50 guests. And instead of shooting them an email, I could shoot them a personalized video to invite them on the podcast. Now they, we we've got to the stage where everyone knows we're using these kind of tools and that person's like, oh, this is a, an automated tool. And I've been thinking about this a lot. And I, I wonder if you do, because like HubSpot is a great platform to personalize things for, for users based upon like certain amount of data. And AI is an incredible, it's gonna be an incredible accelerant of personalization. And I can get into some of the tools that I think will exist in an AI world to help there. But I think it's gonna help us personalize in a way that we've never been able to do before, like on a one-to-one -one basis. But I also think it's gonna become, a, 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 it could also be the death of personalization because everyone knows that that isn't personalized. The AI has done it. And so does it lose its meaning, right? Does a person actually, I think disconnect that, from that from that feeling they get when they get this person pop up and it feels like personal to them. How do you think about that? Because I I think I've been thinking about this a lot. I think it's uh, I mean I think that communications and especially interpersonal communications are very nuanced. So I think that over time, uh, what's in favor, what's out of favor. I was just watching my son just went to a, a college football camp, and one of the things that the coaches said cracked me up. They said. Uh, parents do us a favor and don't like don't get involved when we're trying to talk to the athlete there will be a time where you're going to be brought in be, but like right now we know the difference when you parent are dming us on twitter and and uh, instagram you don't talk or sound anything like kids and so <laughs> we're not dumb when you're like i'm a, a student who does the following and i'm in this <laughs> sports event and they're like so what i think is interesting is that even today in kind of college football recruiting, they know if a parent is being an inauthentic communicator on behalf of someone else. I bring that up to you because at the end of the day, I think that that's not an AI problem, that's just interpersonal. And so if AI, as that accelerant, as you brought it up, is just bad or gross or off tune or like misses the mark, then it won't be effective. No more than if you basically hired a, you know, an offshore firm to come in there and try to recruit for you you know, it's just not going to work. So I always go back to, I just tell people, AI is not the issue. But what if it's amazing, Nicholas? What if it, what if it actually, what if I, what if yeah. I can at one o'clock when I know you're walking your dogs, I can send you I think it's gonna a be great. WhatsApp of, of me, a video of me talking to I think it's gonna be things. great. But, but, because, but it's not, you know, it's not me. But it doesn't matter because that's where it gets like circular here. You just said, what if yeah. it's great? Now, yeah. great to me means that it basically gave value to me as the recipient. Yeah. That's you know what I mean? So it's not about the quality because ironically, another thing I think is going to come up is I actually think typos, ums, stutters. They'll be put back in to make a yes, little more Yes, I think they're yeah, going to actually be very important because at the end of the day, we are kind of messy creatures. And so you don't want to quickly get into the uncanny valley where at the end of the day, everything is like perfect and put together. That's just not the real yeah. world. So right. the reality is, is I think that when you say great, I come away with the great definition means it's great for the recipient. So right. right now, Kieran is like one of my buddies. If you sent me a message that was giving me an update on your holiday stuff, like you're like, here's what I did over the holidays. If it looks like you and it's AI, first off, I'd be like today, I'd be like, oh my God, that was amazing. That was great. 
But then number two, I want to know what's going on in your life. I want to know what's going on. And the fact that you didn't email me, which I'm pretty upset by. No, I'm just kidding. But the fact that you didn't tell me what's going on means that the distance grows between you and your friends. That's true. So the point is, is that if I had gotten that, I wouldn't be upset by it. No more than I'm upset that whenever you send me a Christmas photo card, I know there's some filters on it and I know that it's wrapped in beautiful. Like, I just think that, that stuff is not going to yeah. matter as much. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's, as long as you're get you feel that connection, you're not going to care how it was delivered. I wonder, like, I wonder if someone's going to one of the places I've invested in in terms of companies is like open source models. But you give me an idea now that someone could release like sloppy AI, <laughs> right? Which is just like the real human version of an AI. That's where it's right. Like, oh, my eyes, it's all over the place. Messy LLM. <laughs> yeah, messy LLM. <laughs> so it feels more authentic to us humans. But, it's not but you know what's funny? Like, okay, so let's take this last part. And then, and then if we have to wrap, we can. But I'll tell you this. So take Hey Jen. When I watched the, the demo, I don't know, going back to the Shania Twain thing, being able to get the lips right in the very first video demos, maybe three years ago was whenever they were doing, or four years, it was when they were doing Obama. I don't know if you saw, they were basically working on Obama's lips to basically mm, make it that. sound a certain way. So that was the very first, they've been working on this like in the lab for a long time. Then they went in reverse and they took, I think uh, either Key or Peel, Keen or Peel, they took one of them and then they took Obama's voice and put it over here. So they've been basically decoupling the, the the uh, kind of voice, the lip motion to the audio motion for, for years now. Hey Jen is getting to the point where they're commercializing it, for example. The part that really, really made me smile with Hey Jen was not the, the little X video I saw of the guy doing it. It was, then he translated it into Swahili, then it was translated into Spanish, then it was translated into Japanese, and so, you go back to think now, like, let's just go an either or. Would I like to get a video, AI or not, in a language that I don't understand? Or would I like to get a video in a language I understand? And that, to me, is incredible. So if I have Halligan or Yamini, our CEO, talking, and then she gets to deliver it in a language that is basically more to my you know comprehension etc i don't care if it's ai that's yeah, amazing I agree with that. <clears throat> yeah the translation capabilities of ai are huge like duolingo i think just laid off a bunch of people because the ai is so phenomenal at translation and i think it's going to help companies go international global much much faster totally the 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 one i wanted to end on <clears throat> Um, and we can wrap after this is actually the other category that I think is kind of fascinating. The more AI develops is pattern matching and prediction engines. So we have these in like, B if, we, if we think about B2B, we have these in B2B B to B B today. Sorry, we have these in B2B today where you can like intuit, you can ingest data and like forecast some things, right? But AI is probably going to be a better pattern match had what better pattern match capabilities than anything we've ever had before. And so let me give you the, the example, right? Let's say that we have a prediction engine where AI can actually ingest all of the data, but it can ingest like all of your G2 customer reviews. So it can pattern match against language. If that person responds in a certain way on an email or in live chat, they can predict like if that person needs to see this feature or that feature. One of the companies I've invested in in the space I tried to invest in was there's been these people launching AI tools that sit in the corner of the screen when a sales rep is on a call and they're having their sales call and it's in real time telling them, giving them some information about that person, how they should actually uh, do that sales call. So is that an area that you've thought much about or heard? I, it wouldn't be a, I don't think it's a thing a marketer would actually say, I need a better prediction engine, but I think it's one of those things that they may get and may be kind of game changing for them. Yeah. We, um, you know, what's funny is on the AI side, the pattern match and things like that is actually older tech, you know, than, than that. But the reality is, is that it required massive amounts of data. So one of the things at HubSpot, you know, we, we, when customers come to us all the time and they're like, you know, tell us about your AI capabilities. One of the things we have to ask them is like, what's their size? Because you have to have a certain inflection point before you have enough data to get a pattern yeah. out of it. Um, and so that's been the case is that there used to be, you know, yet to have a, a pretty significant amount of data that is changing a bit because some of these LLMs basically use a, a kind of a fancy waiting technology where they're like waiting letters. They're like, so they're like finding patterns 
between letters, they're finding patterns between words, they're finding patterns between sentences. So they, by just their very nature, have these extremely sophisticated pattern matching engines built in, not because that's its core task, which is what kind of the old AI was doing. The old AI was basically a very generic, hey, just try to figure out a scatter plot or a density chart or things like that. Now they're built in because they're trying to find across billions of parameters the patterns. So they're just naturally good at this. And they've got a superpower in that, you know, this is controversial too. Like, I think that they do have knowledge locked in there. So you were talking about the hallucinations. People are pretty grumpy about like them not being that smart. I think all of human language actually has knowledge locked into it. Super meta concept anyways. But if you take what you said, the pattern matching, plus they have this kind of knowledge locked in there. Well, we've been able to do things that HubSpot- What do you mean by knowledge locked in, Nicholas? Well, for an example, that. like, uh, Right now, if you were to go before you ask ChatGPT, uh, you know, to, to go search the web, you don't have to ask it. Tell me about a dog. It will get the things. Right. OK. Yeah, so yeah. the real as to, the thing is, what's funny is like, you know, when I effectively ask you a question, what's happening in your human computer is that you're going to synthesize all of the things that basically have been your worldview to date. And then you're going to tell me that. And. You know, when we're talking about this reason why we all Google check each other, humans are wrong a lot. But at the end of the day, I don't go around going, well, Kieran doesn't know anything. He didn't know. <laughs> he's hallucinated. Yeah, he's hallucinating he's, again. He's hallucinated three times today. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, the more basically Kieran uh, can answer a question about a subject, the, the smarter I think Kieran is. And the more Kieran basically can basically be self-aware where he goes, and I think he's using language to basically pre-qualify the nuance of his of his understanding. That's where these LLMs are not quite there yet. They're not saying, I'm pretty sure, or they're not giving a confidence signal in their answer. But the point is, I think Kieran's smart when I ask him a bunch of questions that he gets it right. Right now, if we were to sit down and ask the LLM about the expanse of the world, tell me about whales and tell me about this country and tell me this, I bet it would smoke any one of us as humans. <laughs> so the deal is it has all of this knowledge baked in that we don't give it credit for because we're like, oh, it's not 100% accurate or it has a chance for failure. But when I go back and I begin to think of it again as a really smart college intern, well, it's brilliant. Right. So now you take this brilliant college intern who doesn't know much about your business. They don't know your industry. They don't know any, they haven't been really tuned into your particular worldview. They just have a bunch of general knowledge. You take this really smart college intern and you give it a spreadsheet and you say to it, hey man, what patterns can you spot here? It's good, it's good. And I'll give you an example. We took HubSpot's CRM database and we basically posted it over just a CSV file into ChatGPT and we were asking questions like, uh, who do you think I should call first? We literally gave it no other prompt. Who do you think you should call first? And it was like, well, based off deal opportunity size, you would call this first. Or based off who's most interested in you, you would call this first. Like it, it was not dumb, it got it, it got it right. And then we were exactly. like, this is where it was really smart. And it was like, okay, so if you were to do this, what would you send to the person? And it was like, well, based off the bit that I know right now, I would send this and it was pretty good. Now, go all the way back to what we were telling the audience a minute ago. Craft, you know, as an example, that's context. We could have given it more. We could have said things like, hmm, some sort of custom property that says, don't call me for six months, for example. Now it has a little bit more content, but that's just like an intern. If the intern called Kieran and was like, hey, would you like to buy so-and-so? And Kieran's like, I told you to never call me. <laughs> like that just means we didn't give it enough context. And so the deal is now knowing that the role, you're a BDR, you're trying to get a meeting, action, you're gonna create a series of emails to reach out there format and we would be able to teach it. This is where it gets even more amazing. You'd be able to teach it now, HubSpot can, but like otherwise you could tell it, hey, when we talk about our company, we're short, we're pithy, we're not trying to waste a lot of time. So now you've got the format and then you're like target. You're gonna send this to Kieran who is a you know chief you know marketing officer that has a podcast and is into that. So you give it all of that target. So then it comes up with a really pithy, hey Kieran, I know you're super busy, man. I love your latest podcast, but would love to go ahead and get on your calendar about X, Y, and Z. You might still ignore it just like everybody else. But that pattern was figured out from all the stuff we just did. And so we're not there yet. Many companies are not there. Most people are overselling 
kind of AI at this point. But that pattern matching is built in for not the reasons that we used to, which are these giant math formulas. Those will still be important, by the way. So like predictive lead scoring, and predictive forecasting, that, that's all important. But these pattern matches will go in a completely different direction because of how these LLMs have that built in. And why that's, you're seeing that already in gene folding, you're seeing that in new drug discovery, they're using that LLM model to do that. So anyways, going back to, you know, I'll, the last thing I'll leave it with, with marketers is that pattern matching right now will start to pop up in tools like HubSpot where it's like, here's an interesting list you might want to reach out to. And that's where I think it's going to begin exactly. to emerge. Yeah, I, th I think um, <clears throat> like one of the quotes Sam made last week was don't build startup founders. He was at a YC event and he said to startup founders, don't build with GPT-4 weaknesses in mind because they'll be solved in GPT-5. It makes me think that this is going to be a step function. And I think that pattern matching is going to be so much, much better to the point where I do think in the future, like a salesperson, a marketer can get their instructions from an AI in terms of what they should focus on next, right? Like actually we think that you should focus on the brand or here, because this is your weak point. Same with the salesperson. You should call these next 10 people next because of this reason. And that that's starting to get to like, today we have this really smart intern. And to your point, like if you tell an intern, give it really bad instructions, you're gonna get really bad output, right? So like if you get really imp good input, you can have much better. But at some point I think we flip and the AI is like, we're the intern <laughs> and the AI, AI is telling us what to do. And I think GBT5 is the first step there. The other thing I'll just end with is, AI is a really good example of this like human psychology where 18 months ago, we just didn't have this technology, right? Today we have this technology that probably like 10 years ago or like five years ago would have been the things that we dreamt about when we were younger, like watched on TV. And then within 18 months you're there like, yeah, it's good, but you know, I, did this one, I did this one query and it hallucinated, kind of sucks as well. Like just like humans get something and immediately just like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> What's yeah. the next thing? Well, we're very like adaptable. We're very, yeah, we're very adaptable creatures. Um, a little bit of a spicy take is uh, I am a big believer in this collaborative model and I don't get upset when I collaborate with somebody smarter than me. If, if anything, I think a sign of like a really well-grounded human is that you seek out those smarter than you because you have your own goal and your goal is different than the person's next to you goal. And so at the end of the day, if you're goal oriented, you know, you're trying to effectively accomplish something for your job or your work or your family, then at the end of the day, you just care about basically moving closer to that goal. And all of these resources become accretive to the process. One spicy take I have is that uh, right now, humans, when they work with this stuff, are the basically smartest person in the room. And I think that for a breadth and a depth reason, the AI tools will become better than humans. And I'll, I'll give yes. you an example. So like in social media, um, right now, there is a breadth process. So you've got to have a social media strategy that's kind of coherent with your goals, your brands, things like that. You then have to have a publishing motion. So it's got to publish not only interesting stuff, but per network. It's got to have a certain rhythm of how often do you publish. It's got to have a variety of publishing types. So it can't all just be like, check this out. Can I have some business? Check this out. Can I have some business? Check this out. Can I have some business? It's like thought leadership posts. It's basically commentary posts. It's referential posts back to your stuff. It's basically evergreen posts. There's a whole bunch of stuff there on the publishing. Then on the monitoring side, it's got to listen and understand the context of what's going on. We're, we're working on some cool stuff where like, at the end of the day, I was using the multimodal and we posted some stuff on publishing on uh, social media. And the very first response was not about our post. It was that, hey, HubSpot's failing me in this particular way and I'm pissed off. So an AI has to understand what was the original post. Right. It has to understand about the company and then it has to understand what this person's problem is and then have a sequence of steps. So let's look at that. It's got strategy, publishing, monitoring, some sort of analytics, that's the breadth. And then the depth is how good are you at each? There's a wide variety in social media strategies, there's a wide variety in publishing interests, there's a wide variety in how good you are. I think that we're probably 18 months away or less from social media being able to do all of that. And the combination of that doesn't mean that it's better than a human in any one of those, but the combination of that is better than any Exactly. <laughs> the amount of <clears throat> The amount of uh, knowledge it can retain and get through is just like 
And so that's why I think these agents, which is something that we're really fascinated by, agents are the next wave where it's going to be, in my opinion, where now I'm the social media boss. And even if I'm the, the, the social media manager, whatever, like I'm someone does it, I'll basically be working with an agent that is better than me across the whole spectrum. And I will basically be working with it. And that's where I think in the next 18 months, AI will be better than humans in a bunch of areas. It's not a scary thing. It's a good thing, in my opinion. Yes. Uh, off. <clears throat> I, I sent you something. We can cut this bad out. Um, okay. Going, yeah, the pace of evolution is uh, incredible. Okay, we're going to cut it there. We could keep going for, for hours and then we should do a part two. But Nicholas, I want to thank you for coming on Marketing Against the Green. This has been a fascinating look into how marketers should think about marketing within the future and in particular, like how they should think about AI's impact within it. Yeah, we could do a whole nother session on this stuff. We barely even cracked the surface. Cool. Until next time, everyone, this has been Marketing Against the Grain. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better.